we have, well, we're now at the uh, bottom of the hour, so we'll, we'll get going now and stick to schedule. Uh, we're here right now. We're going to start with hands-on sessions. What I'm going to do is talk about Monai architecture briefly, and then we'll be getting into transforms at the end of the slides and then into the first notebook that we're going to be working with. So that's going to be hands-on where you are going to be able to start playing with Monai and uh, see the, the bits and pieces in action uh, from, the, from the transform perspective. And then from there, we'll move on to later lectures. They're going to introduce more components of Monai and more concepts and uh, give you the chance to uh, experiment with them as well, too, as we go along. So it's going to be mostly of you doing some things with Monai. And I will, I guess, give a bit of an explanation at the very beginning of the notebooks, but then leave you to it afterwards and let you play with yourself and ask us questions along the way. So just advance. There we are. So this is, as we discussed what Monai is, this is a, a large framework for adding all the pieces that we need to have to be doing deep learning in healthcare imaging. And it is community supported and community focused. We really do want to be bringing in people to bring in their ideas and their, their actual software and to do all the, all the useful things that people need to be doing and try and reduce a lot of the overhead that we have when developing software for doing biomedical um, image analysis and, and other healthcare tasks with uh, deep learning. So we do have quite a need for this kind of a framework. We do have many biomedical applications that have very specific requirements. You know, we have uh, tasks in deep learning that are real time, some that are not, some that are about analyzing images, some about text or other sorts of input data, obviously genetics as well too. We have many different imaging modalities at the very least, uh, the MR, CT, ultrasound, these are the ones I'm most familiar with, but there are, are other sorts of imaging uh, modes that you're going to definitely see in doing medical deep learning. And so having a framework that can deal with these image formats to be able to read and write to, to them is going to be a very useful tool to have. And people, for the, to a large degree, just sort of figure out their own solutions as they go along. So having one centralized solution would be very much ideal for people to reduce their own workload and accelerate the whole process of doing their experiments. So dealing with the data formats as well, of course, is going to be a big part of that. So DICOM, Nifty, Files, these are the ones that, I, once again, I'm most familiar with, but there are many others, many just normal photographic file formats like uh, JPEG and PNG and such that we use as well too for storing information. You know, We want to have a framework that can handle all of these and be able to actually take this information and uh, assimilate it into a way that is then useful for a training pipeline. Certain network architectures themselves, we know, are best suited for biomedical applications. Uh, UNET, of course, is the one that we, we know most about, I would say. It's, it's something that really does suit segmentation for biomedical tasks, and this is what we have here, uh, amongst other things. So having the networks there that are in a format that people can then reuse easily would be really ideal, so people don't need to be rewriting and reinventing the wheel constantly. Finally, we have data transforms that are specific to biomedical applications. And being able to, to process data and process particular types of image modalities and be sensitive to the semantic content that these images have is something that would be a very, very useful for the kind of applications we'd be doing. And of course, the, not just during training, but as a post-processing step to produce our, our correct outputs. Reproducibility is another major component of what we want to, to have. So being able to distribute the software to make ex our own experiments reproducible and accessible to other scientists and also you know to, to a huge to degree to the, to the general public as well too we want to demonstrate what it is that we're actually doing and what our results are and show people what it is that actually is involved in the science you know even if people are not going to go ahead and read our code they're going to at least see that we are putting it out there what it is that we're doing for anyone to scrutinize so reproducibility and accessibility are really important things and so having a better quality code base to be able to allow this would certainly make this much easier for all of us a community driven library of course with this we would have a ways of of re reusing a lot of the code that we would develop and and avoid all the reimplementation that quite often happens you know so having a, a framework that is easily understood and easily learned from people who are starting out and you know especially for students of course you know it's something that is going to be easy for people to start using immediately and not give them the illusion that doing it themselves from scratch is going to be somehow faster. 
you know, having something like this that will, will certainly re make it much easier for people to collaborate on the same code base will accelerate all the, the all the, the actual software development activities. And then having a baseline of networks and other sorts of data handling infrastructure around those networks for uh, 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 submitted papers would be a very useful component to, the, to reproducibility as well too. Quite often people, when they uh, publish papers, they will have code available or they will have a repository mentioned in their papers. And these will then have their own code for implementing whatever their experiments were and you know some links to their own data or the actual data included. So all, quite often these are going to be implemented in, in very specific ways to that piece of paper or to some particular framework that's being developed within that research group. So having a more uh, generally used common framework would make this process a lot easier and make it a lot, uh, a lot more accessible to take that work that others have done and re-implement it or reapply it to new experiments or to new research areas. So we, we want to have a framework that allow people to do that, but also include within uh, the MONI itself uh, a number of baseline implementations of known networks for known particular, particular papers, along with the data sets that they that the papers were publishing on so that there's a basis for comparison between what some people are getting with their own experiments versus what the, what the, the, the real baseline should be as published in papers. So how does Mona address the need for these things? So we will be discussing data loading and the handling uh, in the next uh, slides a little bit and then going into a bit more detail in, in later notebooks as well. We have a large set of data transforms to represent the actual operations to process and regularize data and apply to actual augmentations during training. So randomized uh, deformations of images in some way that doesn't obliterate the semantic uh, content, but will still present the variation that allows networks to learn in a more generalized way. So these things are there in our transforms components. We also are going to have our own library of general purpose networks and loss functions. And these are designed to be quite malleable and quite uh, adaptable to different situations or to uh, different applications. You know, networks that have configurable number of layers or configurable components within certain layers and, and configurable block definitions. These are the objectives that we are aiming for with our network definitions. We have a number of metric types for evaluating our results and looking at uh, the progress during training. And these met metrics, again, are things that are focused at the kind of common biomedical tasks that we would encounter. So for example, segmentation, we want to analyze the quality of segmentations and define uh, some metric that will uh, capture uh, some variations that maybe don't have uh, gradients in the sense that they could be used for training, but are still useful metrics of what is or is not a good segmentation. At a slightly higher level, we want to have some workflows with Monai as well that will provide a simple environment for uh, creating training scripts or training notebooks and try and encapsulate the, the, the common idioms or the common code patterns that one would use for training, for example, the training group itself, so that we're not reduplicating that code all over again. Uh, workflows are meant to uh, provide you with classes that can easily encapsulate uh, the actual uh, infrastructure of the training process for you to be easily accessible and easily reused. And then uh, efficient and fast data loaders. This is for loading data in, in an efficient way and using certain strategies like caching or uh, um, making things persistent that we will cover later on in, in later slides, but these are very useful features uh, that we want to have in Monai because we are quite often doing with very large data sets, you know, quite often data sets that can't be stored fully in memory. And so we need to have efficient strategies to deal with those sorts of constraints. And we might be loading data from remote sources as well too. And so we need to have strategies to deal with those issues as, as well. We also want to have support for doing multi-GPU and multi-node multi-GPU training. So being able to distribute the training process across multiple GPUs and multiple nodes on multi-node cluster systems. Uh, we want to be able to use automatic mixed precision that is provided through PyTorch. And quite often we do want to integrate our own custom kernels. So being able to interface with C++ and CUDA is one of the things that we are starting to provide and have examples for. The reproducibility component of this, we, I did discuss this al already a bit, uh, but being able to have a framework that is going to have the same 
somewhat basic code base that everyone's going to be working off. Then that means everyone's starting from the same base point. People aren't re re-implementing the same thing over and over. There's no reinvention of the wheel, hopefully. And so people then can read other uh, collaborators code or other scientists code and be able to understand much more quickly what's going on because again the, the, there's a common basis for for the language being discussed as well as uh, the common basis for the types of things like augmentations or data processing uh, regimes that are being used so that when people go to re-implement or to adapt code from a published uh, research there's the commonality of understanding about how these things actually work and then how they can take the pieces that have been used and reuse those in their own research and how they can take those 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 concepts and be able to use them much more immediately without having to re-implement and reinvent how these things are are, are defined and the specific ways in which Mona is defined helps us do that because we are going to be targeting designing our system in a way that is compatible with existing code to a huge degree. So our design is designed to be flexible and modular. Our, our infrastructure, as it were, in the actual framework itself is, is very much on the light side. It is not designed to provide you with a particular framework that you certainly must use to get any goodness out of Monai. Uh, our components are all very much loosely coupled. Our, our external library requirements that are, are hard requirements are simply PyTorch and NumPy. So these are the only things that you most absolutely need to have to be able to use Monai. There are other uh, uh, requirements that are soft requirements. So if you aren't using certain libraries, then certain features will not be available, but many other features will be. And, and a lot of the transforms, for example, will rely on NumPy alone. Our network layer and block types are designed to be implemented with PyTorch extension classes only. So these, these classes adhere to the, the PyTorch way of things in the sense that they don't rely on infrastructure or environmental details that are not normally expected with PyTorch uh, classes. And so using these def definitions in Monai with existing PyTorch training scripts or with other, other existing code uh, should be quite straightforward because there's no real requirements that you need to have in place as set up by a Monai infrastructure or any other kind of Monai backend uh, code that must be present. Similarly, our transforms are implemented as callable objects. And the way that the that our whole system is works in the background is that you can mix and match with transforms introduced as simply callables or ones that actually inherit from our transform classes. They don't need to inherit from these, however. But again, NumPy is the the common interface between all these components. And so just having things that will interoperate with NumPy is all you need to do to be able to introduce your own code into a transform pipeline or use individual transformers within your own pipeline if that's what you want to be able to take things out and just use them and mix and match however you wish. And our workflow and our handler types for handling uh, a higher level training process API is implemented as extensions on the Ignite framework, which is one of the other uh, frameworks that's part of the PyTorch ecosystem. So we'll see a little bit of this later on as well too. But again, the, this is an optional component. You do not need to be using these pieces to use the other bits of Monai. We don't require you to use Ignite in any way. We do provide our own uh, our own training uh, loops, or examples certainly of them that you can then use. And of course you can use with your own. And we have examples with Lightning and Catalyst as well too, which are other members of the PyTorch ecosystem that are out there as high level frameworks. So our individual modules, as I say, are designed to be optional components and, and loosely coupled together. So it's up to you to pick and choose the bits and pieces that you like. And our interoperability is through the, adhering to that PyTorch design style. During uh, our development, we've adhered to a very robust uh, continuous integration and continuous deployment uh, methodology. And we've we, we pride ourselves in developing quite a large test suite for the system. So Monai is meant to provide a, a base of, of good quality code as well as not just a broad framework, but something that, that should be a, a good basis for, for quality extension code that people may want to build on top of. And code that, that should be uh, maintaining its uh, compatibility through versions as well too, so we don't pull rugs out from underneath people into the future. So this is a very high level overview of the module structure here in Monai. So our transforms module has very uh, a big number of sub modules that do particular tasks. They contain transforms for uh, doing cropping, padding, intensity, shifting, IO, and such like that. 
our data module has some modules for how we load data, how we have uh, readers for particular image formats, and how we have savers for formats as well too. So those pieces will go into a bit detail in later uh, parts of, the, uh, of this uh, session. Our networks module contains some modules for actual network definitions themselves and nets, and also for uh, the low-level layers and for sort of the mid-level block components that networks are sort of built out of. We have a number of other modules for defining our losses, for defining our C++ CUDA interfaces, defining metrics, and again, the engine and handlers that inherit from, from Ignite. So just uh, a brief overview here. As I mentioned, we have our, our networks and the components that make, it, make up those. Uh, our transforms uh, classes and the augmentations that go along with them, and then data handling, losses, metrics. And uh, as I said, the, the, the Monai framework is very light on the, on, the, on the infrastructural side of things, as these pieces are all meant to be very much modular components. So there's, there's not very much actually going on in the other smaller modules, and there's a lot of utility things that are, once again, as I say, optional components of this. And components for visualization with TensorBoard, for example, are, are present, but again, not necessary. So we'll go into a bit more detail here on transforms and a little bit on loading with data sets and data loader. And then the notebook will go into a bit more detail of playing around with transforms and looking at them at the actual you know, implementation level, at the actual software level of things. So our transform classes, they process data, they will apply randomized augmentations, they will load and save data as well too. And they it can be broken up into these somewhat broad categories where we have uh, crop pad submodules for doing cropping padding, obviously. Uh, it, others for uh, uh, adjusting the intensity of images. So for doing things uh, like normalizing the range of image data. So from, for MR, that makes a lot of sense. For CT, it certainly doesn't. Uh, for doing other uh, adjustment of the actual raw images to standardize them into a particular form, if that's what you uh, want to be doing. Uh, spatial transformations. This is you know, rotating, shifting, and uh, freeform deformations as well too. So doing non-rigid deformation to again introduce variation and these can be done in a way that is sensitive to the particular sorts of uh, uh, images that you have so you want to treat actual image data versus say labels differently so how you deform uh, segmentation would be quite different from how you deform the image itself what how you'd actually uh, what, what basis function, for example, you'd use to, to, to do these things. So the, our, our transforms are designed to take these, these requirements into account that are really important for ensuring that you're feeding correct data to your networks during the training process. IO, of course, contains reading and writing file uh, 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 transforms. POST is for doing post inference, post processing operations. So uh, taking uh, data from uh, the network as you're applying inference and and maybe putting this into new file formats to export or into uh, you know, putting together larger images from doing patchwise inference. Other utilities like that are there in, in that section. I have a number of utility transforms for converting to or from tensors for uh, using uh, uh, maps throughout your transforms or for using uh, individual arrays throughout the transforms. There's, there's a number of different ones in there as well as compose, which is one that we'll see quite often. As I said, all these transforms are defined as callable objects, so you can introduce your own callables in the transform pipeline as well, too. The compose class, as I said, is going to be quite critical. We'll see coming up. And it will be very familiar to anyone who's familiar with Torch Vision. So a number of the, 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 the architectural ideas that are present in Torch Vision we do use here in, in Monai, and even though we implement things, that the ideas are still there and still going to be very familiar to you because once again, we want to adhere to the PyTorch way of doing things. So uh, in the data section, in the data sub uh, modules, we have these submodules, the, the data set class and its subclasses that define the mechanisms for actually defining the data set and applying uh, transforms to the data sets that are already present. So this in encapsulates just the basic data set that defines a sequence of items. And whenever these items are requested, transforms are applied to them. And it also defines the subtypes for this class that will implement our caching or persistent strategies. Uh, Wenchi will go into more details about that later on. 
uh, image reader encapsulates a generic interface for reading images from the different file formats that we need to deal with. So this will include subtypes for reading using the ITK library and the things that it's compatible with or any Babel or uh, PIL for loading natural images. And all this is represented through a standard interface used by the load image transform. Savers, of course, is doing the opposite here, where it's going to be saving things out to our standard file formats and being able to put the data together to be suitable to put out to those files. And there's a number of other utilities for working with data sets and for generating synthetic data and for partitioning data sets as well. So looking at an example code here, I know code is never pleasant to look at in slides, so just bear with me for a moment. Uh, this is an example of a transform sequence. We're using Compose here to put together a linear sequence of transforms. So input data to the Compose transform gets sent to the first transform in that sequence, then the output gets sent to the second one along, and so on and so forth. What we're going to do here is load images based on a sequence of file names, scale the intensity to, of the image values to range 0 to 1, uh, add our one size channel, uh, because again, uh, PyTorch, if people are coming from the TensorFlow world, is channel first. So it's going to add that channel to the very, as being the very first dimension. Uh, we then uh, randomly choose a 96 square patch from somewhere in that image, and that becomes the output to the next uh, transform. And that is a random augmentation because it says random at the very beginning. We're going to randomly rotate by 90 degrees. So this is going to take that square image and just rotate 90, 180, or 270 degrees um, half the time. And then we're going to take whatever the output is and turn that into a PyTorch tensor. So looking at what that code looks like when it's actually uh, run, we are going to start with our data set that's going to consist of the actual file names themselves. We create our data set by passing that in, as well as our trans sequence of transforms. And then our data loader is constructed from that data set. And it's the data loader's task to figure out what to do when you ask for a batch of a certain size. So when you ask for a batch of size 10, for example, it's going to use two different processes to go out and ask for 10 different items from the data set. And it's going to be responsible for ensuring all of that is efficient and correctly parallelized. We then look at the output from that, and this is exactly what we expect, a, a 40 tensor that contains 10 instances of our image and it's on the negative one device, which is to say the CPU. So the actual details on doing things with data set and the, 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 the more specialized subtypes of data set when she will be talking you through. For now, however, we're going to move on to the first notebook, which uh, is going to be a hands-on exercise of just running the cells one after another and just seeing what you get and maybe playing around with, with varying some of the parameters or, or using some of the different transforms that aren't actually shown there but can be imported. So do we have any questions right now? So can everyone see the notebook? So with Lab One Notebook, what we're going to do, of course, start with our imports here and with our pip command to install Monai. So that's the very first thing to, to try to make sure that you can get things installed correctly. Uh, the, the TAs will be helping with that if you have any questions, of course. Uh, we're going to then create some synthetic data. So to work through the notebook, just run each cell as you go along in sequence. And then we're going to start looking at what transforms actually are. So we're going to get our load nifty transform here and then just apply it to a file name just to load up what it looks like. So this is just the very start of looking at what our transforms are uh, and then looking at what Compose is going to do for us and then adding a few more and so on and so forth from there. So I'm going to stop talking. I'm going to let everyone crack on with the notebooks and people can ask questions as we go along and uh, get help from the TAs or myself or Ben or whomever else if we need it. So take your time with your notebooks and uh, after a while we'll ping you again and then we'll go through the notebooks and, and Eric will highlight the the most important takeaways as you already started with the first couple of cells.
points were the notebook. Uh, can everyone see our notebook then? Yes, okay. we can I'll, see the notebook. I'll assume. OK, so where I left off here on the first uh, cell where we had an actual transform. So we're using this one to load our nifty file. And when we do it, we get a, a volume that's 256 cubed. So that's what we expect from this image. When we move down to using Compose here, what's going to happen, of course, is the data from whatever this transform is gets passed to add channel. And so our output has uh, one extra dimension to it, as we expect. And again, this is the PyTorch format for anyone coming from the TensorFlow world. If we add more channel or more uh, transforms to our Compose sequence, so the last one here, if we add to Tensor, this is, of course, going to create for us a PyTorch tensor object instead. And this is going to wrap whatever the NumPy object was that came out of the previous uh, transform. And as you can see, the device is still negative one, so it's still on the CPU. Uh, moving it to a particular GPU is then going to be code elsewhere that we need to worry about. Now, this example here, we have a Compose sequence that is going to use Lambda to apply a Python function as a transform. So this is going to take as input some image that's going to come from the previous transform. And then you have to return whatever the modified result is. In our particular case here, what we've done is just taking our volume and taking the sum over dimension one. So that's just going to squash it down uh, in the width dimension and give us a 2D image that we can then plot and see all of the spheres that are in our image here. We can, in a different way, define our transform by actually inheriting from the class itself. And in this case, we can then uh, add some arguments. In the case here, we can actually choose which dimension we want to sum over. So here we can choose the dimension number two and then get a different image out of that. So we'll sum over the, the height dimension instead. And this is what we get. So these are the, the two ways of introducing your own code into the transform sequence, either by inheriting classes directly or using uh, one of the Lambda classes that are out there. Now, randomization is an important task to be introducing augmentations to your data. So being able to actually randomly modify what it is you're doing such that the actual output is different each and every time you run the, the, the transform sequence to get a new image for a batch. So our rand additive noise class here is going to inherit from two different classes. One of them is transform, the other is randomizable. And this is what will be used later on to choose which part of, trans of the transform sequence is actually randomized, which part is going to be deterministic. And this is something important for caching and for persistency. However, what we're concerned with here is randomizing our state. So every class has a, uh, its own random state that we keep. And what this will do for us is then um, modify uh, the, that random state whenever we are asked for uh, the next uh, object. So whenever the call method is called, this will randomize whatever the state is and then apply whatever randomization using a different method to our input to produce a new output. So that's pretty straightforward. And we do that here. And if we run this multiple times, we'll actually get different values out of this. Um, have I run enough cells? Yeah. So if I run different times, well, it's deterministic here because I think I've set. Yeah, so I keep creating it again. So if I run it again, well, it should be different each time. I think what I've done is set something to be set. Anyhow, this is what it, it will do a randomized sequence for you. And the random state thing that's internal to it is what is going to determine that randomization. Now, the transforms we've seen so far run off of re uh, accepting and returning single NumPy arrays. What we can do instead is define transforms that are going to use dictionary types. So these dictionary uh, values are what are going to be the input and outputs. And this allows us to be able to pass multiple inputs or outputs down our sequence uh, and also allow us to, uh, to choose which members of a dictionary to actually modify. So if we wish to leave other, others alone, we're allowed to do that in this case. So we can pass along information unchanged from one transform to the next, not require us to modify it. So what we're going to do here is recreate our temporary data as a, a bunch of image segmentation pairs. And what our actual sequence of file names is going to be is a set of dictionaries containing those two images keyed to the values image and seg. So we're going to have a bunch, a list of dictionaries as our actual sequence of input to our, our transform sequence. 
then we must import the transforms that have the D suffix, which indicate that they work with dictionaries. Then we start to apply, I'll just run that one. And then as we apply our, our, our dictionary transforms, we get the same sort of results as we expect. If we look at the keys for this dictionary, we have the image and seg keys as we expect, contain image and segmentation. But we also have the dictionaries containing the, the metadata, which is to say the headers from the, num from the nifty files. So if you have uh, auxiliary information, this is a way of introducing this into your transform sequence and that this information can be added or removed by different transforms as they go through the sequence. So if we look at a composed sequence here, we're going to use lambda D and we can pass into these our functions here, which are going to uh, be given in this case, going to be single value, single images, uh, single array, values here, and then they're going to uh, apply whatever it is that they are, whatever their operation is, to each of the members as the lambdas uh, has been given. So in this case, our load nifty D and add channel D are going to operate over the keys that we've given to them. In this case, it's going to be both image and seg. Uh, for this one, this lambda D is only going to operate over the image, so we're only going to sum the width of the image itself in our dictionary. And then the second one only operates on the member seg. So it's only going to take the maximal width for the segmentation. So this is a way of applying different operations to different members of a dictionary. So in, in our case, we want to apply different operations to the image than what we do to the segmentation. And this makes sense for a lot of different sorts of segmentation tasks that we want to be doing. So converting to it from integers or for making sure that things are, are clean segmentations and the images are smoother perhaps. And we apply this transform sequence and we look at what our outputs are and this is what we get. So that's as expected. And for doing randomization, uh, doing the random sequence is the same sort of concept here. We want to randomize our state and then apply that to the members as requested from the dictionary. So in the actual call method itself, what we need to uh, recall is that there's a keys member taken from randomizable. And what this will do is or sorry, from map transform. What this will do is recall which keys we actually want to apply the transform to. We are going to make a copy of the input dictionary this, uh, in this way, and then modify the members of that dictionary as defined by that keys. And so that will take that transform and apply it to the next things along. In this case, what we're gonna be doing is using an instance of our rand additive noise transform from above, which uh, operates on single numpy arrays and apply it to single numpy arrays one at a time as we pull them out of our array. In this case, we're not worried about the randomization being different each time, but if we were, we would want to reset the random state of the, of the transform, the internal transform uh, each time through the loop to ensure that we're applying the same operation to, for example, the images and the uh, segmentations. We can throw this together once again with compose and we get the results we expect. So we've, in this case, we're adding noise to the image only. And so the segmentation image stays clean. This is what we expect. Now, the, we, we looked at how the transforms work, but the final part is actually using them to load data and putting them together into batches to send to our networks for training or to for inference if we're going to be doing some sort of uh, post-training inference or otherwise actually using this as part of a deploy sequence. If we're deploying our network somewhere, we want to actually be able to use all this together as part of that uh, deploy infrastructure. So in this case, what we're going to do is uh, create our, our composed transforms as usual and then create our data set class. And this will apply the transform sequence whenever we ask for a member from the data set. So the, the initial value will be whatever the, our images is. Um, in this case, we're just pulling out the image name from our sequence because this is going to be the old school one that is not using uh, dictionaries. Uh, and then we're gonna ask for the first member of that and that is going to be the output as we expect. It's going to be a torch tensor that's four dimensions. Similarly, we can do this with uh, dictionaries as well. Uh, we can also do this with the array data set class to, for uh, using images and segmentations together. Uh, but using the non-dictionary uh, transform. So in this case, we have two different transform sequences, but the array data set will ensure that the random states are synchronized between them so that the same operation is applied to each. So the at random spatial crop will choose the same window in either the, the, in the image and the segmentation so that you, you, don't, you don't lose the synchronization between the two, which is what you expect. 
And then finally, we look at doing this with our dictionary types. Again, we create our data set and the, the data set will handle applying the transforms when we ask for members. And you can see there's an output there that's properly synchronized as we expect. And then finally, data loader, which is actually the PyTorch class. So if you're familiar with it with PyTorch infrastructure, this is doing the exact same thing. This will just put together a batch from our data set uh, using however many workers and whatever batch size you like. And then we can look at our data, our outputs there. And that is what is going on with this notebook. So it's, it, it's a bit of a long one, but there's uh, a lot of concepts here that I think should be quite familiar with people, with, uh, familiar with uh, doing things in the PyTorch way. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I'm gonna hand over to Ben.